All right, well, still with U.S. politics, a man accused of breaking into the U.S. House Speaker's home and assaulting her husband entered a not guilty plea last hour. The court ordered he be held without bail. David DePop is facing eight charges. Those include attempted kidnappings of Nancy Pelosi and the attempted murder of her husband, Paul. The 42-year-old man, originally from British Columbia, allegedly broke into Pelosi's home last Friday, demanding to know where the speaker was. Nancy Pelosi was not home, but after a struggle, the pop allegedly struck Paul Pelosi in the head with a hammer. Paul Pelosi remains in intensive care, but is reportedly recovering. Just hours after the attack, federal security officials issued a warning. Domestic violent extremists pose a heightened threat to the midterm elections. Tess Owens is a senior reporter at Vice News covering extremism, political violence, and ultranationalists. So she's busy these days. She joins us now from New York. So, uh, Tess Owens, I, I know you've taken a deep dive into David DePap's online presence. I mean, what did you find out? What do we know about this man? Thank you so much for having me. Um, so one thing that we found out, my colleague uh, Matt Lamoureux and myself, we connected um, two blogs uh, belonging to um, Mr. De Pape, and both of which uh, he appeared to espouse a range of kind of a whole grab bag of far right conspiracy theories. Um, he went on sort of anti Semitic tirades, misogynistic ramblings, uh, appeared to sort of also um, espouse kind of conspiracy theories about the 2020 election, claiming that Trump was the true winner, COVID conspiracies, you name it. And you know, what we do know as well is that, you know, about a decade ago, he was sort of more involved. He was a sort of a hemp jewelry maker involved in the nudist community and hippies. And in his own writings and these blogs, he says that it was around 2014 that he got radicalized into kind of far right, the far right online ecosystem. And the point that the radicalization point was actually a thing called Gamergate, which was this um misogynistic uh, troll campaign against diversity and women in uh, in video games. And so this was the sort of the gateway into, into this world. And, you know, we still don't know what the motive was for allegedly kind of breaking into the Pelosi house and, um, and, and attacking Paul Pelosi. But, you know, it is clear what he, what he has said in his own word. He told, he told police that he was looking for the house speaker for Nancy Pelosi. He wanted to take her hostage he wanted to um, to break her kneecaps to send a message to other members of Congress. And during all of this, he sort of went on ramblings about tyranny. So I think we're going to find out a little bit more about what exactly his ideology as it relates to Nancy Pelosi is. Right. So, so the Justice Department has laid out a pretty clear summary that, in their view, this was a home invasion and an assault with an attempted kidnapping bundled in. But you mentioned he was steeped in conspiracy theories, and there's conspiracy theories already out there about this incident, right? So, I mean, what, what can you tell us about how this assault is playing out in some of the more extreme corners of the political world? I mean, the news was so fresh about this attack. And it was just breaking on Friday. It was still in the, you know, the early hours of the morning on the West Coast. And already the misinformation machine was hard at work trying to skew the facts of this case, of this incident. You know, we had people claiming already that it was, you know, just another example of crime gone wild in, 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 in Democrat running cities, which is a sort of a line we're hearing a lot from GOP candidates on the campaign trail ahead of the midterms. You know, then we started hearing there was a there was a local news report that claimed that um, the Pape was in his underwear when he when he broke into the house and people conspiracy they're seized on this to claim that there was some sort of love affair happening between Paul Pelosi and David De Pape. That claim that the underwear claim at least that was retracted and um, and the news outlet issued a correction. But by then it was too late. You know, we already had Donald Trump Jr. posting memes about it. Like that narrative has really taken hold. And it's so difficult when you're up against that much disinformation from quite influential figures, like even the new owner of Twitter, Elon Musk, was tweeting out disinformation about this. It's quite, it's a big challenge, I think, probably from, I imagine, from a law enforcement perspective, but also from perspective of trying to cover this, this uh, case. It's interesting, though, to see, uh, you know, you mentioned Donald Trump Jr. You see a lot of Republicans kind of making fun of this and sort of playing footsie with the conspiracy to some degree on social media. I mean, the attack itself was condemned by Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy, but not sort of this reaction and mockery. I, I mean, what should we make of that? I think it's just part of this sort of normalization of political violence that we're seeing here in the U.S. And, 
you know, this has been sort of ongoing for the last couple of years, but it's particularly stark as we head into the midterms, you know, in just a week, week or so. And, you know, the, the, as, as you mentioned earlier, that, you know, DHS and FBI and Capitol Police, this is something that they are very concerned about. They put out a bulletin the same day that the attack happened on the Pelosi residents, saying that they are deeply concerned about election conspiracies and political violence and lone wolf attacks um, during and after the election. And in that report as well, the Capitol Police, they cited their own data mm. saying that in 2016, they had logged 900 threats against Law, members of Congress, lawmakers, that last year went up to 9,600. And so this is just, a, just a, a, a totally different kind of world that we're dealing with. So, so how worried should we be? I mean, the midterms just around the corner, you got, you know, everybody's warning about these risks of political violence. I mean, how real a threat is this? I mean, what happened on January 6th seems inconceivable, yet it happened. I mean, how worried should we be about these particular set of elections? I mean, look, I mean, you don't want to discourage people from going out to vote and 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 you know that's their that's their right they should be going out to vote um it's but it is clear that i think authorities are going to be on high alert you know there's been elections offices in places have taken um active shooter training there is an elections office in florida that's had bulletproof glass put in another one in arizona that had its walls reinforced with kevlar this what the materials used to make um bulletproof vests and so clearly you know elections officers they know that they're a target and they've been putting in security measures in place and there is a concern and there already has been examples of you know vigilantism in states where there are particularly sensitive races going on especially in Arizona and you know I think one of the big concerns is not just the election day itself but I think what unfolds after the election and some of those states where there are really really contested races you know like in Georgia and Pennsylvania um in Arizona that's 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 what you know I think where people are particularly worried Okay, Tess Owen. I think I said Tess Owens earlier, so my apologies. Tess Owen at <laughs> Vice News. Time. Thank you so much and great work. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News channel or click the link for another video.